So uh, without further ado, we want to welcome and thank Christine Thomas for making time to be with us tonight. I expect that Christine is not a stranger to almost any of us, but um, she is someone who has had a long career in Wisconsin as a conservationist who's worn many hats. Um, as you probably know, Christine retired in 2020, just a little over a year ago, as the Dean of the College of Natural Resources at the UW-Stevens Point. And Point is one of the strongest natural resource programs in the country. Many of us on this call, not me, many of you on this call are graduates of Point or have children who are graduates of a Point Natural Resources program. Christine led that program for over 15 years. Uh, she was also a two-term uh, member of the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board. She served for 12 years on the NRB, including three years as chair. Um, her final turn ended in April 2015. Um, uh, but Christine was one of the NRB members who really helped write the history of the NRB and its importance in Wisconsin conservation. Uh, among a long list of things she's done that I'm not going to go much further on, um, I think Christine's leadership in forming the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program and, and just her mentorship in introducing so many young people, including so many young women and women of all ages to conservation has been really an inspiration and something this field has needed badly. So, Christine, um, we're glad that you're here. I'd be remiss in not also adding that you were inducted into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame in 2017. But um, we would love to turn the floor over to you and, and hear your thoughts. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me. I've uh, been looking forward to this, to see so many people out in the audience whose paths I've crossed many times <laughs> the years. Um, my main presentation, we talked about Natural Resources Board and we talked about future leaders in natural resources. And I decided that many of you have probably seen my Natural Resources Board presentation. So we can save that for some just general questions and discussion uh, when, when I get done uh, with my main presentation. Um, but my main presentation is one I dug out. Uh, I, I had a little epiphany about two o'clock in the morning that reminded me I actually have a presentation on this that I was asked to do by Jim Kurth, who was the um, director of the Fish and Wildlife Service when I served as vice chair of the Wildlife Hunting Heritage and Conservation Council under the Obama administration. And they had an initiative then called America's Great Outdoors. You may recall that. And, uh, um, and my job, as requested by the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, was to do a presentation and to critique that program as it related to recruiting and retaining natural resources professionals in the future and I was asked to give that presentation at the North American uh, Wildlife and Resource Management Conference. And that was in 2011. So this is a 20, a 10 year old presentation. Sadly, I think this presentation is still relevant because I think many of the issues are still the same. And because we always talk about how important it is to recruit, retrain, re Train, train to diversify. We always talk about that, but we have the attention span of a butterfly when we need to have the attention span of those polar bears who are waiting for photographers to come out of those cages up there in the Arctic Circle. Okay, they stay there for weeks and wait for those people to come out. We, we just flit on to the next shiny object. Um, and so I googled America's Great Outdoors initiative and what I see in Wikipedia is it was never funded and they did, did two annual reports, one in 2010 and one in 2011 or 2011 and 2012 and no one's heard of America's Great Outdoors since. 
Okay, so this big initiative, Secretary of Interior, and, he, and I can tell you this because I watched it, as soon as we switched Secretaries of Interior from um, uh, Salazar to Jewel, we didn't hear much about America's Great Outdoors after that. So I'm, with that, I'm going to also, I'm not very techy. I'm going to share my screen and, and hope this all works and, uh, and we'll go. Okay. Well, Christine's getting that up. I just wanted to mention, I forgot to go over the, uh, the Zoom screen. So if you folks find down the bottom of your screen, there's a place there with a little chat box. If you have a question for Christine during her talk, you can enter that into the chat box by clicking on it and then typing your question. And then we'll field that question during the Q&A. Okay, I think I got it figured out here. All right, so again, thank you. And as I said, this is a presentation I put uh, together at the request of the Obama administration in 2011. In natural resource management uh, industries and NGOs, we are facing the perfect storm. Our first storm is that the baby boomers are marching one last time. They are marching out of their jobs and into retirement. The secretary at this, that time, 10 years ago, the secretary of the Wisconsin DNR reported that 50% of our DNR workforce was eligible to retire. I think most of them are you now. Um, uh, in addition to massive retirements, we also have issues associated with the future of natural resources management. The first of that is the nature of the new recruits is changing. The current group of retiring resource managers includes a large or included a large number of Vietnam era vets who left the armed forces and went to school on the GI Bill. And incidentally, their predecessors left World War II and went to school on the GI Bill and then went into the male dominated natural resources agency workforces. They retired about the time the Vietnam vets were coming in and those folks were probably getting toward the tail end of their retirements now. Um, added to the fact that they are leaving is the fact that folks who are coming into natural resources education programs are a different demographic. The previous demographic came from farms. They already knew how to run a chainsaw. They could haul trailers, launch boats, and they could find the truck at the end of the day. We didn't teach them those things. They came there knowing it, okay? Um, most of them grew up hunting and fishing, and the new, the new demographic is suburban in nature. The good news is there is a lot of interest in natural resources programs at the university level right now. And I would say this, our enrollment is not through the roof. It's actually down from 2011, uh, but our enrollment is up in the College of Natural Resources the last three years running. So, um, and we think with COVID and all that's going on, that's probably good. Um, why, you might ask, are enrollments in natural resources programs strong? Well, in 2011, one of my theories, it was, was coming off of 2008, it was hard to get a job and not that hard to get a student loan. So I think that's one reason. Um, there is also a lot of interest in environmental issues, and at that time, due to the deep water horizon, and today, probably a lot due to climate change, forest fires, and lots of things that you see in the media every day that make young people concerned about their future on this earth. Um, and we're also dealing with a whole generation of folks who were raised on Animal Planet, the Discovery Channel, and all such uh, things that make natural resources and particularly wildlife exciting uh, propositions. Most of our students, uh, highest percentage come in in wildlife. They, I mean, 
in, at the time I made this presentation, we had 600 wildlife majors in the College of Natural Resources. Um, it's not that high now, and they don't all stay in wildlife. They, they figure out they're gonna need a master's degree and they shift uh, over into the other natural resources um, areas. Okay, the third part of our problem is succession planning. With half of the workforce eligible for retirement and little hiring happening for the 15 years previously, who will lead? These problems have, gone, have not gone unnoticed in the national community. The Natural, National Conservation Leadership Institute conducted at the National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia is using seasoned conservation leaders like Mamie Parker to prepare current promising agency and NGO staff for future leadership. Maybe some of you actually were in a cohort that went through NCTC or you know people like Randy Stark who was in a cohort, cohort at NCTC. Um, the lack of practical um, experience with hunting and hunters aspect of our world um, is being addressed by another program called the Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow. And maybe some of you par have participated in that. This is a program that um, takes uh, natural resources and particularly wildlife majors from universities and puts them into programs uh, where they go into the field and exposes them to hunting and to the uh, the North American model of wildlife management. They're not trying to make them hunters. They're trying to, some of them do though, become hunters as a result of this. They're trying to expose them to a, a huge public that they're going to need to deal with for the rest of their career. Okay. My task for that conference was to look at how the president's America's Great Outdoors initiative would help this, help get us in, into, get young people interested in careers in natural resources and in future leadership pro, uh, in NGOs and other places where they could help make the world a better place. The plan recommends providing quality jobs quality career paths, and quality service opportunities. This part of the report is probably the most critical to the future of pro providing qualified natural resource managers. <clears throat> and um, the project is supposed to be inclusive of folks, um, I need to back up here, inclusive of folks who, be, who are income disadvantaged. And I like the idea of inclusivity. I would also like to see the idea of selectivity and high standards for selection. If we are to get the brightest and best, being selected should be an honor. Often these programs have been aimed at troubled youth and how successful have they been in recruiting those who would make a career in a science-based field like natural resources management? I think the Peace Corps is a good model. If the goal is to keep kids off the street, putting them to work on trails may work. If the goal is to create wildlife biologists, and if your resources are limited, then you need a network that starts young and selects based on the probability of success. The plan also suggests a committee review barriers to career pathways in the federal service. Boy, I could give a whole talk on just that, career <laughs> barriers uh, in the federal service. Many of the AGO participants believe the federal hiring system is broken. Going back to our city person, country person analogy, there are sociological reasons why we have trouble recruiting youth to natural resources careers from certain underrepresented groups. Many of the rural populations that we deal with in our agencies do not want to emigrate to other areas. Sending your application to some federal office in Albuquerque, where frankly you will never be heard from again, and moving around the country, never to live in your own community again, does not appeal to most young people or their parents in the groups that you are trying to target. And this also applies to our urban populations. There are many 
recommendations that advocate for access, recreation, and engagement of youth. These are all valuable to our resource professional recruitment effort. While there is a focus on youth, and that is important, I'm going to remind all of you of something I have been saying for 30 years. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. The youth in, in the AGO listening sessions told the people who were doing the listening sessions over and over that parents were not facilitating and they were even providing barriers to participation. And I can tell you from my work on becoming an outdoors woman, when we did some focus groups with diverse audiences, um, the young people, particularly from African American and Asian American um, families, told, told us their parents were not aspiring for them to go into natural resources. Their parents were aspiring for them to be attorneys, dentists, doctors, and things that where they considered their hopefully upward mobile, mobile families to become more upwardly mobile. Okay, so this is a tough place here. I, I'm not suggesting that any of these things I'm talking about are easy or that there's a silver, silver bullet or it's one and done. I'm talking about a coordinated, deep, integrated effort at every level over a sustained period of time. Polar bears, not butterflies, okay, is, is where we need to be. Um, if you want to get youth outdoors, you need to get their mothers and fathers to go outdoors too. We need everyone to be in love with our natural resources, but the reality of what it takes uh, to get here professionally is much different than just having a caring attitude. Natural resources professions require a science base. They require practical skill. They require the ability to work with the public. And often they require advanced degrees. So the two areas where in AGO or all of you, if this is something you're interested in getting involved with, can help us with that are, in, that are in creating interest in providing access to youth and their parents, grandparents, uncles, cousins, and friends of the family. And a more formal approach to creating local opportunities for community involvement that fosters students from a very early age continues that fostering process through high school years and where needed into the university years. This needs to happen um, with coordination at the federal level. Why? They often have resources that they can use to do um, intern programs and work programs and step into the agency programs. They, they have more resources available. But also at the state level with local agencies uh, with universities, with local school districts, and with um, NGOs. So while the planning and objectives for this might be coordinated at the national level, this would really need to be go a think federally, act locally approach. If we care about a positive result, we should follow models that we know work. It is important to serve disadvantaged youth, but there are models that are successful and those that aren't. Whatever we do should connect youth, not only to love of the outdoors, but also the reality of the science involved it takes to get to a career and the practicality of management of natural resources. We get a lot of students who come in and when they find out that what we're about is management, they don't like that idea because they're, they're not thinking about burning up this prairie. They're thinking about standing around out there and watching the butterflies. And they don't like the idea of what has to happen in between to get there. So I think that's one area. So in summary, there are elements um, of the AGO that can help us with future natural resources management. I think they need fleshing out. And of course, no one's going to flesh them out because the report's on the shelf now for, uh, not, for 
nine years and, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, be, but it's important because out there, it's important for us to cultivate the interest of youth because out there somewhere is the next Aldo Leopold, the next Ken Salazar, and the future of all the outdoors, not only in the Americas, but everywhere. Okay, that's my presentation and I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay. Wonderful. It's hard to give a presentation on Zoom. <laughs> I love the attention and you're not getting any attention that you can uh, discern when you're Zooming. It's all a one-way communication. I can't see you smile. I can't hear you laugh. Um, so it's hard to be on point when, uh, when you're Zooming. It, it, it's true. It's even harder to be a comedian. But <laughs> you did great, Christine. Thank you. And we can all use our little applause buttons on, on Zoom there to, to show you. Um, well, we, we've already had a, a couple of questions come in. So if you're ready, we'll, we'll, um, we'll just tee up a couple of those for you. Okay, I'm ready. Um, uh, th this question is from Heather Stricker. So do you think integrating more diverse ontologies into natural resource curricula and management would add to diversity in the field? I've found often that many people do not feel represented in our field um, that's predominantly based on the Western consumptive use of natural resources rather than a more relational worldview of nature. Could diverse ontologies be introduced into the curriculum itself? I th yeah well yes I think that I think that would probably help um, but what I would also say is you know there probably there are programs like that it's just that our program is a management program and you only have so much budget and you only have so much time uh, so many credits to work with and uh, as I don't know how much you've dealt with faculty, but they all think that their every word is the most important thing in the world. And that giving up space of their word to put somebody else's word in there might be the worst thing that ever happened. Um, so, no, I think you have a valid point. There are, I believe, programs like that. And, and it, they might actually attract students. The question is, other than advocacy, what are those students going to do after they graduate? Because the agency person or the, you know, uh, forestry business or whoever it is, they want to know what can you do for me that I need to have done. And so I think that's a, I think that's a tension, right? A, a, a place where where we, we in the management community maybe need to budge a little in order to get some folks hooked in. But in order for that person, unless they're going to go out and, um, and, and have an advocacy role in, say, in an environmental group, um, and honestly, I think they'd be a better advocate if they actually knew about management. So I hope, I hope I've answered your question. Christine, here's another question for you. What are your thoughts about ways to create a more inclusive environment within our natural resource agencies and NGOs? Retention is very important. And the generational differences between the young professionals and their colleagues who have been around a long time can create an environment that does help with retention. I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna kind of grow out of some of this. Um, as retirements happen and younger generations come in, um, I think one of the things that's really hurting, you're talking about atmosphere now, I think. And I think one of the things that's really, I, I just read a, a book and it's, it's, a, it's an old book. It's called Confederates in the Attic. And it was on the best sell, sellers list and this guy 
a Jewish kid from Washington, D.C., grew up enamored with the Confederate side of the Revolutionary War for reasons he can't uh, imagine except liking an underdog. And so in later life, he went all over the South following and interviewing and meeting and what have you. And um, he was a, really appalled by how, um, how much separateness there was everywhere he went between different groups of people based on their race. And, um, and I, I, I'm very worried that right now, because we've got so much vitriol in our world, that it's hard now, hard, atmosphere is harder than I think it has been for a really long time. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, wo a woman, so I'm, I'm a protected class in one way, but not in, in other ways. Um, and I can't help but think that the situation is even harder than it has been for a long time for diverse audiences in many places. I, I know that's negative. I wish I could say something else. I think every one of us just has to work harder in our personal, every, anyone who cares about this has to work harder in our personal relationships with people to try to make a difference. When I was Dean, well, actually for the whole time I was at the university, there was a big focus on, uh, always a focus on diversity and it was always the first thing that ever got cut out of the budget. Anytime there was a, uh, you know, there was always a person hired and then the budgets got cut and that person was like the first one to go. Um, you know, I always said back in the day, I don't even know if this is an appropriate comment to make anymore, but back in the day, 30 some years ago, when anybody would have known who Lee Iacocca was, I used to say, if you were really serious about this, you'd hire Lee Iacocca and give him a budget, not somebody from the downtrodden group who's just out of college and never had a job in their life and is going to be lowest on the totem pole and be the first person to go whenever there's a cutback. I, you know, we say we're serious. Um, and I think we are on some level, but it never is the priority. And uh, when I was Dean and when we worked on recruiting, um, we tried really hard. We have had a person, and, and this is she's still there. It's still her job. Whose job it was, I said, not to recruit people from diverse audiences, but to make relationships with their families. You know, when you go down to the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, and, and you want people to send their children to Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Okay you are asking mom and dad to trust you, trust you, you white person from Stevens Point, trust you with the future of their child. And I think that a lot of times we're, you know, in our agencies, in our businesses, in our universities, we're out recruiting because we want to bring in the numbers and we're not thinking about what kind of an important trust um, bargain you are making with the family of the person whose life you're going to change. So that's kind of my view of that. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. That's, I, I, you have probably seen closer than most what the challenge of making that kind of transition would be. C Christine, there's, um, Another, I think, comment, but maybe you could speak to this as a question also um, about state government and DNR in particular and DNR's efforts to um, recruit more diverse candidates into natural resource positions. Um, this commenter says that the water section of DNR in Milwaukee, for example, is getting proactive um, in uh, trying to do outreach to recruit a broader spectrum of candidates into new positions. What's your experience and what's your advice, I guess, to, to our DNR and other agencies about um, in cr creating a more diverse and representative workforce? 
I think my advice is the same as I did in my presentation, which is get there early, you know, uh, create relationships with families, support these students as they go along. And it's not easy. I, I'll share the experience of a student that we brought in um, from Milwaukee. I'm not going to use his name. Um, and this was an excellent student, a person of color. And um, and uh, came in as an excellent student, had a full ride, everything uh, paid for by a philanthropist, okay? Someone investing in diversity at a very high and intense and personal level. This person, this family invests in diversity uh, over a wide range of students every year, and those students become part of their family. They have a huge family of graduates uh, of our university. And, um, and then a part of the deal was whatever college he was involved in needed to give him a job. And so I gave him a job. I took money out of my budget. I gave him a job, and I assigned him to who I thought was the best mentor that he could get out of our faculty. So this person was supported by the philanthropist, both emotionally, socially, and financially, was supported financially, socially, mentorship-wise in our college. This person is probably just finishing a PhD in a major wildlife program uh, at a very prestigious university right now. And I would tell you that he experienced racism um, from his classmates, okay? He said he'd never, and this is, we did everything we could for this person, but we could not control going to Terry's situation now, the atmosphere and attitudes of the people that he had to work with day to day in the classroom and out in the field. So um, it's when you do, you know, when you do this, the, this kind, kind of, th going now back to you, Fred, you gotta be in for the long haul. You gotta be in there, you know, the whole nine yards and the person has gotta get tough because it isn't necessarily, I can tell you from personal experience, it's not easy to be in the protected class in a place where everyone else is somebody else. Thank you. Great. I think we have uh, time for maybe one more question on the uh, education front here. Um, this question comes from one of our board members, Robin Schmidt. She asks, how do you envision the war on science, so to speak, will influence the future of youth seeing a future in sciences? Can climate change be a turning point for youth to become more engaged and more willing to enter the sciences? Well, I, I think it can be. I think, I mean, young people are interested in these things and they have shown that they're interested in these things. And there are young people who are interested in doing the science and working hard enough to get there. I used to say that I have the best job in the world and that was my faculty job, not my dean job. Um, because every day I got to go to work and be involved with and teach and interact with young people who, who were smart enough and who worked hard enough and took enough science to go to medical school and make $600,000 a year doing being a dentist or a doctor or something else. But they were aspiring to a $25,000 a year LTE job at the Department of Natural Resources because they wanted to save the world. Okay, I think it's there. Uh, it's there already in the, in the youth. Now, I, I personally think we don't have as many uh, American youth are somewhat spoiled. You know, if you go to, go to your clinic, how many of the um, physicians there were born in the United States? 
you know, maybe not half. I, I, I don't have the numbers on that, but a lot of people in other countries are working harder at science because they see it as a way to be upwardly mobile. Great, well, I think we have time for about one more question. And um, I think you're prepared to speak about this. And it, given your background, Christine, on the Natural Resources Board and, and current events on the Natural Resources Board, can you give any advice to us or what would your advice be to Chairman Preen or DNR staff or the legislature with regard to the current controversy, honestly, over the, um, uh, the NRB situation? Okay. Um, well, as Fred knows, I'm not going to talk about any natural resources board members specifically because I think right. as a former natural resources board member, you're kind of part of the club and I think that's sort of bad form. Um, but uh, I, this is what I think. I, I did my doctoral dissertation on the Natural Resources Board and, um, and I, I have never seen in, the, in looking over the past. Now, of course, you don't always know what all the interactions are in the past, and people tend to remember the past in a, in a rosier way, you know, but um, I, I think there, again, we're so divided and so divided along political lines. I, I, I came in with one group in charge, and I went out with another group in charge. And I felt loved by everybody on the Natural Resources Board the whole time, no matter which side of the coin they were on. And I really think that that has been one of the values of the Natural Resources Board and before it, the Conservation Commission. There was a time in I think the like 19, somewhere between 1916 and 1926, I don't remember just the dates, when we had a governor who, who put all the agencies together, we didn't have a forestry department or a conservation or a water or fisheries, he put them all together, parks, forestry, wildlife, board, <coughs> all in one agency called the conservation department. And he put in charge of them a three-person commission that he paid. So they all went on at once. They were all paid by him. And he wasn't, when he wasn't governor, they weren't there anymore. Okay, so that, you know, that model is a model. And that worked on some level. Conservationists didn't like it. The next guy got elected basically to undo that and put in the six year staggered terms and the geographical distribution and to have an orderly flow of power from one, the people that one governor appoints to the people another governor appoints. My personal experience and what virtually everyone I interviewed, everybody who was anybody from 1967 to 1987 was they did not view themselves as representing the governor. They did not, no matter who the governor was, they did not see themselves as representing the legislature. They did not see themselves as representing special interest groups. They saw themselves as board members, part of a board whose job it was to represent the natural resources in a balancing act between the needs of the citizen and the needs of the resource. That is almost 100% what I was told by everyone that served on the board for, during that 20 year period. And that's mostly what I experienced in my 11 years on the board. There was esprit de corps, you were a board member. I, I remember I interviewed somebody who I asked, well, does the governor influence your vote? And the answer was, hell no. He never calls me, and if he did, I wouldn't listen. 
Okay, that's, uh, and, and interestingly, governors thought those board members were representing them, and legislators thought the board members were representing them, and all the special interest groups thought the board members were representing them. And um, I think the value of the board is an orderly flow instead of, we have the federal system, right? I mean, realtors make a killing after the November election every four years if, if there's a change in regime because everybody packs their bag and leaves town and a whole new crew packs their bag and comes into town. So we see what whiplash is like on the, on the national level. The Natural Resources Board provides a smoother transition. They provide a place where the public can speak up the governor can call a secretary over to the to the office and shut the door okay the legislature goes into caucus the staff all meet every day about all kinds of stuff and they don't notice up public meetings the all, two na or more natural resources board members go to the restroom and you have to notice up a public meeting so it's the only place where you are guaranteed that the discussion has to happen in front of you with you involved. And it buffers the, the, the orderly transition, buffers the whiplash effect, and the fact that Natural Resources Board members aren't elected allows them a little bit more leeway um, with regard to special interest groups. So, uh, but if all it's going to do is be the same fight that happens over in the Capitol or happens between the governor and the legislature, then I think you have, other than the citizen participation, you have lost the thing that's important. I can tell you from my experience on the board, things happen sometimes. Uh, I remember a meeting, uh, and again, I won't identify who was secretary, who was the staff, or who were the board members at the time. There was a scenario that happened behind closed doors in a closed lunch meeting that involved a lawsuit, and that's why it was closed. And a board member asked a question about the lawsuit, and the staff person, who wasn't the secretary, said, I'm not going to tell you that because you're not the you're not the client. And before the meeting was over, one of the board members had dialed up the attorney general asking for our own attorney. Because if we're not the client, who are we? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the secretary headed it off by answering the question in a press release. So there was a scenario, I mean, th there is, I'm not saying that it's kumb has always been kumbaya. What I'm saying is, Somehow or another, everyone up to this point has figured out how to keep the train on the track. Okay. Yep. I don't, did I answer your question? Well, there's no perfect answer. Well said. And I, I thank you for sharing that history with us. And I, I, I can't speak for anyone else on this call, but I think that many of us feel just the loss of that sense of trusteeship and that sense of bipartisanship that really has been one of the main attributes of conservation in the state. Oh. I, I, I just hope that, that somehow people can come to their senses and get this back. Because I, I really feel like, do we really want to lose this sort of last vestige of things that keeps us a little different than others? Yeah, thank you. I, I, as I've heard them say on the TV shows, let's give it up for Christine. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for all the good works you're doing. We should let everyone unmute to clap, you know? Right. Uh, well, all right. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're welcome to stay on, but uh, you have a lot of things going on. So I do. Thank you. We'll be in touch. All right. Au revoir.